Hunter War at least. Yeah. Um, and being able to resolve that show and tell is, is pretty important. And luckily Jeremy can't punish him for resolving a show and tell and then, you know, not having a pact or something along those lines. So it looks like uh, Jeremy is keeping his seven card hand, but Brian is mulliganing here down to six, right. um, which is you know something that happens a lot with combo decks. And this is a sort of combo deck that actually mulligans pretty well. It's a, it's well, it only requires you know three cards to win. You need a hive mind, a show and tell, and a pact of some sort. You can also do just show and tell and Emrakul, which it also plays. So because of that, I think once it has you know two or th all three pieces, basically, you know, it, it can ha even, even a six card hand can be very good. Yeah. Um, and so those sorts of like two card combo decks uh, or three card combo decks tend to mulligan much better than the sort of combo decks like Storm that depend on getting a, a critical mass of resources. Uh, so it looks like we're both keeping after Brian mulligans to six. He starts off with a Scalding Tarn and we're going to fetch Probably a basic island, I'd imagine. Yeah, we, at least in the dark, there's no reason for him to go for a dual land here, as long as he has another land in his hand. Um, you know, play, it, it's probably definitely best for him to be in the dark playing, playing around wastelands. Yep. So, we're pondering, we've got another land, looks like we've got sh two show and tells, and, and the hive mind. Yeah. Okay, so we're so just looking for packs here. Right. And he does see he has a, an ancient tomb, but mana doesn't particularly seem to be the problem. Um, he, how important would you say it is for him to keep second copies of each of, you know, of the show and tell? If you, at least right now he doesn't know what his opponent's on. If he know, knew his opponent was on Bug Delver, how important is it for him to, you know, get redundancy in his hand? So having redundant show and tells is not very effective, but having redundant, certainly having redundant packs and... Uh, hive minds is very useful. So the reason you would never done show and tells is eventually, if you're against discard, you can just cast the spell. Yes. Um, the the one thing that redundant show and tells gives you is it's a way to beat counter spells because you can cast show and tell. If it gets countered, you, you don't fight over it, and then you cast show and tell again the next turn. Uh, and because it's not the actual thing that you're putting into play that gets countered, you get to repeat that process. So it's it's something that. You know, having the redundancy there is good if Jeremy has Force of Wills, but it's pretty bad if, you know, he if he's relying on counter spells. All right. So Jeremy also fetching a basic. At this point, he still doesn't actually know what deck his opponent's on. His opponent could easily be on Rug Delver. Yeah. Uh, and can we can we double check that we have the right deck list and the right person? I think that's not Jeremy Edwards because. The deck list I'm looking at doesn't actually have a force. So yeah, it looks I, like a Jun deck yeah, to me. Um, so, if it is a Jun deck, then... Well, certainly we'll change the matchup. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Jer so Brian's going to be in much better shape if it is a Jun deck. Um, again, those... Yeah, yeah this is definitely Jun. Yeah. So, discard is the only thing he has to worry about, and the fact that Jeremy... Uh, and that's probably not Jeremy. We're going to keep calling him Jeremy until we figure out who he actually is. Uh, because he, he just has to worry about discard, and there wasn't discard played initially. Ah, uh, it's John Edwards, not Jeremy Edwards. Okay, uh, three. <laughs> so Our apologies for those, of, especially to John there for getting... <laughs> but, uh, all right, so we have this up. It's correct. John is playing Jun, not, not Bug Delver. Yeah, so Brian's pretty far ahead. He hasn't, like, you'd expect a discard spell to be played early. Uh, that hasn't happened. John clearly doesn't know what the matchup is because he's fetched double basic here. Um, so, you know, that, that's not any failing of John's. He's being well, careful, but, you know. What other, so what other decks could you put? Let's, I think you can start to, talk, to put him on a deck. You know, what kind of decks would, would just fetch for Island, Ponder, then play another fetch and say go? Like, it could theoretically happen out of Rug Delver, but that becomes Rug very Delver unlikely. Rug Delver doesn't run islands. Yeah, it doesn't run, it doesn't run a basic and, island. And they're certainly not running fluted deltas. They're going right. to be all on Misty Rainforest and Scalding Tarns. Um, and there, there actually isn't a need for that, but if right. you look they, at they, everybody... Right, if you're playing the net that, deck, you know, it could still be... I mean, Ancient Tomb is, first of all, a dead giveaway that we're looking at a combo yeah. deck. So when, when you see Fetch for Island and you see Ancient Tomb, then you should probably immediately be putting them on a show and tell probably sneak and show um, but 
if you if you recognize Brian right. Elliott, you should you should put him on high of mind. Um, he is until we saw this. Ancient Tomb, it could have technically been High Tide even at this point. Yeah, High Tide is an option. Uh, some sort of blue white miracles deck, a stone blade deck. Um, mm -hmm. There there are options, but somebody fetching basic island on turn one, you're probably not going to be running into a deck that runs wasteland unless like it's some psychotic version of Stoneforge Mystic, like Esper Stoneblade that is running one or two wastelands. Um, that's or well, you're not going to see any fetch lands out of Merfolk, so that, that's about the only option there. So when we look at the the weapons that John has in this matchup. He has three Thoughtseize, one Inquisition, he has three Hymn to Turox, and four Liliana of the Veil as his ways to interact. And his ways to interact with Brian's hand or combo. Outside of that, probably what John's looking for is somewhat of a fast clock, as I think, given enough turns, you know, John can't permanently stop, you know, he can't permanently shut down the combo deck outside of Liliana. Yeah. Uh, so, Looks like I actually misidentified things before. It wasn't show and tells that it was Brian intuition. had. It was intuition. So he's got a hand of hive mind, intuition, and uh, and grim monolith, and hive mind pact of negation. Uh, and so he's going to be able to intuition for show and tells here. Okay. So we also have a wasteland on the ancient tomb. If we didn't have the wasteland on the ancient tomb. Uh, Brian could have actually won on the next turn by intuitioning for show and tells, then, uh, then show and telling the hive mind into play. After the hive mind resolves, casting the grim monolith and pact and negating it. Mm -hmm. um, that's not going to be possible right now, but Brian is still still in really good shape here. Um, he's floated some mana, I believe, for. Uh, to be able to play intuition once John tries to pass the turn. Right. And that's what happens here. And I imagine he's just going to go get some hive minds. Okay, so and at this point, there's no danger really to, you know, he, he's then at that point been to three of his four hive minds. Um, so he's, he's still a mana short for next turn, next turn for comboing. I believe he's got another ancient tomb in hand. Oh, if he hasn't, okay, if he has another yeah. ancient tomb. So. He's, yeah. So we he's he's going to be a man short for the next turn, but what he can do, like if he draws a blue spell, for example, he can uh, spend mana on his turn to cast the Grim Monolith, setting up for the next turn. Right. Hard so so how much? Of what, there is a worry here. Then if John say has another thought seize, then Brian will be out of hive mind. That's not a super big worry. He's got the backup plan of Emrakul, and you right. can always get an Emrakul into your graveyard to reshuffle the hive minds to be able to intuition for them again. Uh, so. You're you're not like dead if he thought right. he's dead. It's not good. You have for a second, yeah. It's not good for you, but it's you, there but, is a secondary plan. Yeah, there there are actually reasonable backup plans. Uh, so have we drawn for the turn? I think we've just untapped. Right. So yeah. we're looking at at upkeep, possible upkeep. I'm not sure what his upkeep decision is. Brian may just be thinking through the turn. Okay. Yeah. So drawing our card. And I think... You know, City of Trader is drawn. Yeah, I think we're just going to see him play out... Uh, well, actually, he might decide to wait one turn... Uh, for Grim Monolith? For the Grim Monolith, Monolith to play around Abrupt Decay out of his opponent. But it, it turns out he's not. Right, I mean, the reason he doesn't have to there is even if it does get Abrupt Decay, he'll still have six mana next turn thanks to the City of Traders he's just drawn. Right, but so it, because he has Pact of Negation in hand, he needs to draw a spell that he can cast right. uh, the same turn that he casts Hive Mind. So he's kind of relying on like drawing a Brainstorm or a Ponder or something along those lines next turn. So having the extra mana is useful. So what are the dangers of him running out of high tide and then trying to you know counter a spell, maybe hoping to draw a spell the following turn? Other, outside of, you know, he, he certainly would then open up to Maelstrom Pulse. Yeah. But outside of that, there's not too much direct enchantment removal that John would have. Yeah, they're, they're, Maelstrom Pulse is the only card that John could have that would impact that place. And that's so, a one of. Yeah, if that. Um, so in, in, the, in this particular case, it is a one of. Right. So let's see what John is up to. He's playing a Badlands for the turn. Which is good for Brian that he's not getting wastelanded. And I'd imagine this is a Bloodbraid Elf that we're going to see. Yep, so we've got a Bloodbraid Elf. We're going to spin the wheel. 
see whether we hit anything useful. And blubbered up into thought seas is, I think, is, is quite useful here. Yeah, and so this this is going to punish the the intuition that we saw before. Um, I, I still like the intuition play from Brian. He knew that his opponent had just drawn the previous thought seas because he didn't lead with thought seas. He didn't do anything on turn one. So like it's. It's a very good read, rather, that your opponent doesn't have a thought seize and probably doesn't have a him based on the way they fetched. Uh, so I, I think it's a very reasonable defensible play. And Brian is now going to have to you know, go back to the Emmerpool plan, which is going to take a little work to do and maybe maybe difficult. Okay, now he's looking at pact and negating, pact and negationing here because he is able to pay for it on the next upkeep, which yeah. is which is a pretty which that's is a good heads up play. So Brian's going to spend the next turn paying for the pact. It's going to tap his Grim Monolith, but it's going to be easier to rebuild and find another. Well, pact. I mean, his other his, his option here is that if he packs, then he just has a. If he packs with negation, this means he only has to. Sorry, this means he only has to find another pact, of which he has seven more in the deck. Yeah. Uh, the other line means he'd have to find a Show and Tell and an Emrakul, which, given how the board looks, seems unlikely to be able to find that before even getting beaten before being be beaten by Bloodbraid Elf and Deathrite Shaman. Yeah. No, Brian's, Brian's play is definitely the correct one. So Brian is taking this attack from Bloodbraid Elf, it's fetching, getting a Volcanic Island, which... Well, let's see, does he have anything main deck that's actually going to push for that? Um, what are you looking for? Just looking to see... So he could have fetched for a basic island, which I think uh, is... Why he's, choosing, why he's choosing to get a dual land instead yeah. of that. So, like, getting, getting the Volcanic Island means that he could pay for his own Pact of the Titan. Uh, but I think that's the only thing in the main deck that he would want red for. And honestly, like, it, it seems a little yeah. risky to, to open yourself up to yeah. Wasteland there. That said, like, you know, you're already a yeah, I'm not sure why. Wasteland. I'm not sure why it would be that instead of an island. So we pay for the pact, pass the turn back to John. So Brian on his hand now two cards, I believe. One, a hive mind, and then an unknown. Yeah, the, the card he drew for the turn. Um, and you know, the, the next turn, he is simply going to play the hive oh, mind. Oh, and he's drawn another pact. So, as long as he, so if he can draw another spell, he'll get to untap next turn um, with, all right, he gets Inquisition of Kozilek. That's Which is going to take an attack. Yeah. Which is fine. Uh, you know, it's on tap with nine mana next turn. I, I mean, he, he essentially just has to let that happen. Yep. So, next turn he's going to play the Pact and Negate. Or he's going to pay the uh, hard cast the Hive Mind. Yeah, so, John, with another Bloodbraid Elf here, now has Brian mm -hmm. down on a two turn clock. Or what, what is presumably a two turn clock. Yeah. So, yeah. we have six here. Six here. And then and next turn should be lethal. So, so Brian has a lot of work to do if he wants yeah. to try to pull off this hive mind. Brian needs to draw exactly Pact of the Titan or Brainstorm into Land Pact, Pact of the, of the Titan. Titan. Um, he doesn't, have, doesn't necessarily have to be into a land, even. He can uh, just, oh, yeah. Sorry. If Grim Monolith is not going to do it. John should, John should be able to take game one here. And Brian okay. knows it. So John Edwards, uh, a couple timely, a timely cascade there for the thought sees, and then following it up with, with an Inquisition, able to keep keep the hive mind off, not hive mind off the table, basically all the packs and all the uh, second halves of the combo off the table. Yep, and you can you can see sort of the resiliency of the hive mind deck here. You know, there there was a lot of disruption. Things went very wrong for Brian, and he still almost won that game. Um, he, you know, he was able, he was going to be able to cast the Hive Mind on that turn, um, and, you know, if, if the multiple, uh, disruption spells from John, you know, if John had only had two discard spells instead of three, Brian would have won that. Right. So, shall we take a look at sideboards? Well, in the sideboard, um, so as opposed to when we were kind of discussing it before, uh, the Jun deck does have a lot of very good sideboarding options. Um, he has in his board uh, another Inquisition, two Duresses, and a possibility to board into Surgical Extraction, mm -hmm. um, which I think he probably has enough dead cards in this matchup that we'll see all of those come in. Yeah, so we're, we're definitely going to want to take out the Abrupt Decays. 
um, and the Maelstrom Pulse is, is also not going to be good enough. Well, you know, the, the one Maelstrom Pulse, it's possible that, I mean, the only thing it can do is actually, yeah, is to get a, get a hive mind, which, if at all possible, Brian doesn't ever actually give him a chance to do, you know, won't, won't just run out of hive. Mind. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a corner case that Maelstrom Pulse would be useful, and as a one of, you know, that's a corner case of a corner case. So I think we're taking out the three abrupt decays. We're taking out the Maelstrom Pulse. We're taking out the life from the loan right. like, in all likelihood. Uh, and we can also have the option of taking out the Lightning Bolts, which you are just going You probably can shave some number if you believe you have a better card to use. Yeah. Now that said, Lightning Bolt is less dead than the other cards. Yeah. Um, and the, the same sort of goes for Grim Lavamancer and Scavenging Ooze. You know, those those are just one ones and two twos in this matchup for the now, most he also, part. You no, know, he also has one Null Rod in the sideboard. Obviously not a great card in the matchup, but if he's but it does it's it's somewhat live. It does stop Grim Monoliths. Yeah. So it's it's not the sort of thing that I'm looking to bring in. But if I had like if I had 15 abrupt decays, right, it, I would bring it, it in. It would come in over a Lightning Bolt if he chooses to yeah. chose to board it in. So I think I think you can. So you're definitely going to bring in the Inquisition of Kozlak. You're definitely going to bring in the four Pyroblasts yeah. that he has. You're going to bring in the two Duraces. Um, and you can... So I, I, I would consider bringing in the Surgical Extractions. Like, right. it only blanks the Intuitions, but it's pretty good when they are forced to Intuition. Right. So blank, blank, yeah, it only really... Surgical, one of those, you know, this isn't actually a graveyard deck. Um, there's, you know, it, there's some utility of it where sometimes in conjunction with Thoughtseize you can actually start to strip strip cards from the deck that are yep. relevant. So that said, it's, you know, that effect of saying, you know, this two-card combo with discard is typically not good enough to justify the slot. You know, you'd rather, like, to, you know, that effect is not good enough to, to justify just playing the card. Um, you'd rather just have another threat. So I, I would imagine, yeah, he probably won't board in many surgicals, if at all. Yeah. Um, the Pyroblasts can be a little bit awkward in that they're, you know, they're not very good Cascades, um, but the rest of what we're boarding in is, is pretty good. Right, so those Cascades do get watered down a little bit, but the, I think just the strength of Pyroblast in the matchup makes them, you know, I, I, he shouldn't be as worried about that. Yeah. Uh, and so for Brian, um, one of the things about these combo decks is that you don't want to sideboard too much because you can't water down, you know, your search and exactly. your combo. Um, I'd imagine that his plan for this matchup, which he would have prepared for, is to simply bring in the four ley lines of sanctity because so much of the Jung plan for disrupting you is targeted discard. Exactly. Um, that said, cards he might board out. Um, he so he might board out. Let's look at cards. You know, cards that he would board out. Then, so we're talking about. You know, he does have to water down his combo a bit as his whole main deck is devoted toward the combo. Um, uh, so this is this is a place that he may just d decide to board out the four force, force of wills. Exactly. Uh, you don't really want to be two for one in yourself to prevent a discard spell. Yeah, force of will is interestingly enough one of those cards that's, that it, it's actually a fairly weak card except when it's completely amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, for, force of will is often in legacy a card that you want to defend yourself from combo, and you know it's a fairish card there. It's usually pretty bad against other fair decks if you're if you're in a fair deck mirror of you know stoneforge mystic versus blue white miracles or bug or whatever um, or the actual mirror it tends not to be very good um, but where it really shines is defending yourself or is aggressively pushing through your combo against other people's disruption exactly. that is counter spell based uh, so it looks like Brian, who's on the play, has kept his seven, but John uh, has decided that he needs uh, something more than, than was in his opening hand. Right. So one of the interesting things about this matchup of what I presume is that post-board, um, it becomes... So pre-board, we had this thing where late game favored Brian. Mm -hmm. You know, John had to put on somewhat of a clock because if both players are, are allowed to draw enough cards, you know, Brian will eventually resolve a hive mind intact. Now that John has all this like has four pyroblasts and has all this this discard, I'm not sure that's still the case. I feel like in a certain sense, Brian has to become more of an aggro deck here. I, that, the question of that is entirely dependent on whether Brian has, has a ley line opening hand. If he has an opening hand, then he's got an inevitability. Uh, if he doesn't, then he needs to combo before John can strip his hand and, and really punish him. Right. Um, so what, that, what that'll mean is, you know, if it's... That'll affect, you know, John's keeps. Can John keep, you know, an all-disruption hand? And 
provided there's no ley line, like John can probably get away with that post board. Yeah. If I were John, I'd, be, I'd I want something that has disruption, but I also want something with a clock. Yeah, ideally you would have both, but I think you, you know, th yeah, the question would be whether or not you're... Yeah, yeah. So we see an input, uh, we see a Gitaxian probe from Brian Elliott that shows us a Liliana of the Veil, a Him uh, to Turok, and a Deathrite Shaman, along with a Fetchland, a Bayou, and a Taiga. If you'd like to sign up, you can do so with Ricky over here at Side Events. He'll be happy to get you in. So this is this is a pretty reasonable six. It's got disruption. It's, it's excellent. Uh, we've got you know some ramp, um, and the fact that we've got two pieces of disruption is pretty nice. Additionally, the Liliana gives John some Edward uh, John some outs to uh, an Emrakul from Brian from that right. Plan B. What I like about M Liliana in the matchup is it's both disruption and in a way a win condition. Yep. Uh, so. We see that Brian has kept in the forces. He's got a show and tell. He's got a pact of negation, um, and he does have the hive mind in addition to three lands. So this is a pretty ideal opener. He's just going to need to find some way to actually cast the pact of negation on his turn. Right. Uh, he doesn't, and he draws a white ley line on the <laughs> as his first draw. Um, because he doesn't have an ancient tomb or a city of traders, he's going to have to wait one more turn. Uh, him to Turok could do a number on this hand. Yeah, and there's a decent chance that Brian actually chooses to force a him um, and be in control of what of what he is discarding. Um, certainly, if the ley line were a blue card, any blue card, he would force there. Right. Um, but as it is, like he's he probably won't because he would have to pitch one of his um, piece one of his pieces for uh, for getting the combo out. And, you know, unless he gets very unlucky, that's going to be approximately the same damage that the him is going to do. So we see there, John has boarded in Surgical Extractions, we saw that while shuffling. Okay. Um, so the option here is whether John would play for Liliana to be mana efficient or to play for him to Turok. Well, I'm of the opinion that I think that him is the correct play here. I agree. It's more disruptive. With Hivemind, you do have to worry about a turn three win. And most Hivemind, if he does have a turn three win, Liliana very likely will not stop it. Yeah. Uh, so Brian immediately forces with the pack negation. Uh, I think his plan is probably to just show and tell the hive mind in next turn, exactly. which makes him immune to the future discard and lets him, you know, as soon as he draws a pact, be able to win the game on the spot. So, so a fetch land drawn by Brian, yeah, he's, yep, so while he still can, we will almost certainly see Brian resolve a hive mind. Or you know, resolve a show and tell and get a hive mind. Yeah. I was gonna think through, make sure that this is the the play that makes sense. Um, but given given what he's seen of John's deck, I, I don't imagine him doing anything other than show and tell this turn. Players who are seeing to see Brian go ahead with that line and show and tell the hive mind into the hive mind into play. We don't know what John has actually drawn, what so it might need to just be a land for him as scavenging ooze. Yeah. So scavenging ooze in this matchup is a grizzly bear. Uh, it's a two-two, um, and you know this is this is a card that you wish you could sideboard out, uh, but you know if you don't have enough cards to bring in and there are a lot of dead cards in John's deck, then you you leave it in because it is a clock. But right. that's one Grizzly of the Bear's best. not not completely unplayable in the matchup. It, yep. it, it attacks, which is pretty relevant. Uh, and I guess it does does give him the option of exiling um, cards that were intuition for. Um, although, given the fact that you have surgical extractions in your in your deck, you probably don't you want, to, want do to do that. that. Yeah. So now we're in a race to see whether Grizzly Bear plus Deathrite Shaman is able to kill Brian faster than Brian is able to find a way to search up a pact. Right, so Brian does not actually have a castable spell in his hand, so were he to find a pact of negation, he's going to need one other one additional spell. True, although a, a pact of the Titan will immediately win him the game. Right. Well Well actually, not no, a, that's, actually not true. that's not true at all. John can pay for Pact of the Titan. Uh, or well, currently he can, but one land he will. Yes. Yeah, with one more land, that, one more land will give John a fairly decent insurance, you know, insurance policy there. And <laughs> right on time, um, 
Yeah, Brian's going to play Pack of the Titan. Of the Titan. Both players get a 4 4, and John is one land short of being able to pay for yeah. that. And this is actually kind of an interesting uh, point going back to the show and tell we had last turn. One of the options John had, instead of putting his scavenging ooze into play, he could have chosen to put his land into play, hoping to draw another land um, on his turn in order to play around uh, Brian top decking a Pact of the Titan. Um, that's like a very, very narrow corner case, and it's probably better to, to have the Grizzly Bear in play um, and get two extra damage in and increase the clock. Um, but, that you know, it's an option that you be, have. Yeah. So. Certainly if John had something along the lines of, you know, a, a second a second Death Rite Shaman or some way, you know, because Death Rite Shaman makes any color mana, John can set up boards where he make, gets himself pretty immune to packs. Yeah. I, I think I think the correct play for the pact, if he had two lands in hand, would have been would to have been show, show and tell a land into play, certainly. Yeah. So we see Brian explain to, to John exactly how the combo works and what's going to happen to him. And John says, yep, I've played Legacy for the past couple of years. I, I basically right. understand what's going on here. Uh, and we shuffle up for game three. Um, we'll see if John decides that he wants to change his sideboard at all. We see as he's shuffling that he did bring in the Pyroblast, and we saw the Surgical Extractions. Uh, we mm -hmm. haven't seen the Duresses yet, but they they have to be in almost there. almost certainly would be in. Uh, so, you know, he, he brought in all the cards that we thought he would. Uh, there's some question about what he took out and what he was able to leave in. I, I think he, he probably did basically what we thought. The entire set of lightning the bolts. The four lightning bolts, the three abrupt decays, and the one Maelstrom Pulse to bring in those and, cards. And the life from the loam. And the life from the loam. And probably the Grim Lava Mancer and Shave so, the Scavenging Ooze. Something like that, yeah, that, yeah. Which would give him, which, that would give him enough slots to bring in all the cards that we saw. One card I wanted to talk about, actually in John's sideboard, is Koth of the Hammer. So no. that is a spicy one. Uh, I I actually haven't seen that in uh, Legacy yet, but it makes it actually makes a lot of sense in this deck. Um, for for a while, when people were playing back when people played Zoo, and then later when people played Maverick, one of the ways that you got advantage both in the mirror and against control decks was bringing in Planeswalkers. And mm -hmm. so Elspeth uh, Knight Errant was a card that you brought in. Um, in those cases as a way to just like completely trump your opponent's strategy because it it won the game by itself and it was very difficult to remove. There are not a lot of spells that are played in Legacy that deal with Planeswalkers. Um, and so it makes sense that the Jun deck would be interested in, in doing something similar. And Koth is a four mana Planeswalker uh, that is available in those colors that is a very, very scary threat. So as far as, you know, so what you'd be saying is, you know, Koth is just, it's, it's a threat that's a harder to answer threat. Yeah. Um, I think it's the sort of card that you would want to bring in in the mirror and probably against blue-white miracles. Um, I don't know. It might be good against Esper Stoneblade. I mean, like, a lot of these fairish decks, um, it's going to be good against, especially the ones that don't have lightning bolts in them. Um, it's going to be very hard for them to deal with before it goes ultimate, and that's an ultimate that is pretty hard to beat. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the Planeswalker ultimates. So essentially, are boarded in against any deck that has trouble stopping him from making an emblem. Decks that are going to have trouble stopping him from making an emblem. Um, that, so that, that's a good heuristic. I think a better heuristic is in games that you expect to go more than six turns, Koth is going to be. A good thing to bring in. Okay. Um, and I think that's true of most four mana planeswalkers in this format. Yeah, I mean, basically, when you get a third activation off a of planeswalker, that that should be winning you the game or close to it. Yeah, um, and especially if you're getting it out on the third turn, it's pretty exciting through Death Rite Shaman uh, acceleration. So we've exchanged decks. We're shuffling up for game three. John's going to be on the play. And looks like something interesting is happening on the other feature match. They're both looking over there. Uh, so we're passing back the decks, and we're going to be drawing our opening sevens in just a minute and seeing whether anybody wants to mulligan. Right, so Brian, so we have John back on the play. This back on the play this game. Um, there's a chance that you know once again, really the the tone of the match here is going to be set by whether or not Brian has the white ley line in his opener. 
Yeah, it's, it's the most important question. John knows, John also knows about the white light lines because uh, he saw one in that matchup. Um, right. And so, you know, you would, you would expect him to at least be thinking about that as he's sideboarding for game three. Uh, so looking at his hand, it looks like he's got two dual lands and at least one fetch. May have two fetches. That looked like a pretty land-heavy hand for John. I didn't see any disruption, although uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to see. So John has decided that you know that's not good enough for him. He's going to have to mulligan and go to six. And it looks like Brian may be faced with a similarly difficult decision here. He's going into the tank thinking about whether a mulligan. And I think, I think that's a resign keep. keep. So we'll see in a moment whether or not John Edwards is able to keep six or whether he's going to have to go further down to five. Um, and I think I think this is a matchup where John, which is usually a pretty good at mulliganing, um, is actually fairly disadvantaged by it. There are so many things that you need in your opening hand. Right, you need a, you need turns. both a clock and usually like two pieces of disruption in your opening hand to adequately fight a combo deck. And because of that, you know, a six card hand to be able to have lands and all of those things really has to hit on all cylinders. It's likely whatever he keeps will be missing one of those things. Yeah. So right. he does keep, there's a duress in his hand, there's a pyroblast in his hand. And then there's all a land. Thoughtseize and the rest so of land. this white ley line is just brutal. Yeah. Turn zero. So now John has basically has kept a four-card hand of three lands Pyroblast. Um, this is going to be a very difficult game for him. Yep. So City of Traders, Grim Monolith. If Brian has a has a hive mind, he can he can go for it next turn. Uh, I don't believe he has an island in hand. He does have a hive mind, and he definitely does have uh, at least one, possibly two, packed of the Titans in his hand. Um, he's, he's in pretty good shape if all he's missing is an island here. Um, yeah. Although we know that there's a pyroblast. The pyroblast is not is going to create problems. Uh, but so Brian does pass without an island. You, know, you can see that you know he kept this hand on the strength of the ley line and the fact that he has he has all, all these mana all, sources. He, he has these mana sources and he has the combo in the hand. Um, but unfortunately, you know, he's not going to be able to start it off immediately. So John fetches for his second turn, and I presume that he has drawn something that he can play if he's fetching at this point. Yeah, um, yeah, the, the fetch on, yeah, presumably he's doing that, or even at the very least, he may just be fetching on the, on the back of the fact that he feels land flooded. Sure. Um, he just wants to actually get lands out of his deck. There's no danger in making that play in this matchup. Yeah, given I mean, he's not a blue deck, so he doesn't, he doesn't have, have to, to wait worry for brainstorm. about brainstorm or anything like that. And mm -hmm. he does draw a Deathrite Shaman for the turn, which is sort of a clock. Uh, it is going to be attacking for one at some point, and then eventually it'll be able to uh, it'll be able to exile cards from graveyards and deal two a turn. Well. Um... It targets the card. Okay, it target, target doesn't the target the player. Yeah, it targets the card and it deals damage to each part. Each opponent loses two life. Okay, so, that, so Death Rite Shaman's life loss does get around a white light. Yeah. Um, and it's worth noting that the surgical extractions that John has in are also targeting cards in graveyards. Not uh, And therefore are not targeting players and are not dependent on the ley line. But the big thing is that, you know, we are on turn three right now and Brian still is at 20 life. And because John doesn't have really many ways, almost any ways to disrupt right now, that's that's a very dangerous situation for him. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting how, you know, John could have mulliganed and found a threat-heavy hand. And this ma this game would be going very differently, um, but instead he found, you know, a disruption-heavy hand that ended up being, you know, very poor against Brian. So Liliana actually will also work as disruption. She, he can he can plus the Liliana all he wants. I don't believe he, he can't ultimate the Liliana. He yeah. Well, he can ultimate targeting himself, I believe. Right. Uh, but that's not something you want to do. He also is not going to be able to deal with an Emrakul with the Liliana because that does target. Uh, that targets a player. a player. So he'll only have the plus one ability. Yeah. So he'll get to decide whether or not that's something he wants to do. Um, and I feel like, I my guess would be until John's hand becomes more more empty of cards, he may not actually want to do that. Because um, Brian's hand is so full of, you know, it's kind of full of things right now. 
Brian disagrees. Brian's willing to force a will in. Yeah. If I were Brian, I mean, so Brian is expert with this deck and has played this matchup much more than I am, so most of the time that I disagree with him, he's going to be right. If I were in his position, though, I would not force there. Um, I would just discard the ponder. Um, I, I think, like, you're happy having John spend cards right. from his hand. Right, so we're going to... All right, Brian's going to go for his first hive, first attempt on hive mind, because we know this one's not, you know, it's going to meet a pyroblast. Yeah, and uh, presumably Brian is actually going to show and tell uh, for the hive mind here, uh, which you so know, that he plays can, around the pyroblast. Right, because he, cause if, he, if it's countered, he'd like to, he wants the show and tell to be countered, not the actual hive mind to be countered. Exactly. That way it'll, 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 will, will require two counter spells for, from John. So it, it ends up being a bait spell. Uh, yep, fetch happening with City of Traders trigger on the stack. Yeah. That said, there you know you don't always expect a counter spell out of a non-blue deck, so it's possible Brian overlooks that line and, uh, and goes straight for and the goes hive straight mind. for the hive mind, wanting to save the the show and tell for something else. A possible Emrakul. Yeah. Uh, no, but he's going to go for yep. the show and tell. Tight play. It gets pyroblasted, and Brian's like, yep, okay, okay, that's why I did that. Passes the turn back, John presumably is going to exile, exile something. He could exile a land, that's it, he's used his mana, so there's no, no oh, that's play true. available to him. Um, so now John, you know, unless he draws another pyroblast of some sort, he's going to be dead next turn. Well, he actually, sorry. I should pause there. He can actually pay for Pact of the Titan right now. He could pay for a Pact, a of, Pact the of the Titan. So uh, there are two Pact of the Brian Titans in Brian's two. hand. Okay, though. he can't pay for two Titans. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So so Brian should, you know, this should be the green light for Brian. Yeah. So Brian is drawing intuition for the turn. He may be thinking about, do I intuition to set up something a couple turns down with more protection? But that, that seems kind of out of line. Right, um, so there's the, this high mind, and you know, Brian's basically running into what would be a second pyroblast. Yeah. If it, if it were there, Brian would would almost certainly not be able to get get back in the game because he'd be down to one land. But now the the two pack of titans should be enough to get John. Indeed. So we're seeing if John has any response to either of these. He's presumably this, not going the to. The second one's going to be pretty hard to pay for. Yeah. Need a lot of Simeon Spirit Guides to get through that. All right, so Brian Elliott wins two games to one over John Edwards. Uh, this advances to 4 and 0 on the day. Yeah, a good start. And John Edwards still in contention. He's a, uh, he's a regular legacy player around here. Uh, he plays at Mugu Games in Everett. Um, he also, you know, you regularly see him at the Mox tournaments around here. He's been around for a while. 